and welcome to X-Ray Review. In this video, we're going to review a dozen of the most common fractures of the upper extremities. So if you haven't already, please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them below and let's go. So a torus or buckling fracture is an incomplete fracture of a long bone. And these can be really difficult to see because there's no true fracture line visible. Instead, what we're looking for is a bulging or subtle buckling of the cortex. These torus fractures are not easy to see and you have to specifically look for them. When we zoom in close, you'll see two small little bumps and cortical irregularities and these represent the buckling fracture. These are one of the most common fractures of the wrist in children between 5 and 10 years of age. And these injuries are a result from trabecular compression due to axial loading along the long axis of the bone. The distal radial metaphysis is the most common location for a torus fracture in a child. It's usually around 2 to 4 centimeters from the distal growth plate. Here we can see a small torus or buckling fracture, the medial aspect of the distal radius. And if you can see these fractures of the distal radius and ulna, then you're doing good because this is as subtle as it gets. These types of fractures are usually self-limiting and do not require surgery. Splint, rest, and immobilization are usually sufficient. When it comes to metacarpal fractures, there's lots of different ways to break a finger. A Rolando's fracture is a comminuted intraarticular fracture at the base of the first metacarpal. A Bennett's fracture is an intraarticular fracture at the medial aspect of the base of the first metacarpal. And with this, you'll often see dorsal displacement of the first metacarpal. A boxer's fracture is a transverse fracture of the neck of the second or third metacarpal. These are usually due to an impaction injury from a direct blow like a jab with a clenched fist. A barroom fracture is a transverse fracture of the neck of the fourth or fifth metacarpals. This is usually due to an impaction injury from a direct blow like a roundhouse with a clenched fist. Phalanx fractures or fractures of the finger are very common and their prognosis really depends on their location. Involvement of the nail bed or articular surface may cause complications. For example, bleeding from the nail bed from a fracture is treated as an open fracture due to the risk of infection. When it comes to evaluating for fractures of the hand or fingers, always take frontal, lateral, and oblique views. You always need a minimum of two perpendicular views in radiology. Radial head fractures are the most common elbow fracture in an adult. Radiographically, we're looking for a small vertical fracture line extending through the articular surface of the radial head. Radial head fractures are usually a result of indirect trauma such as fall on an outstretched arm or a foosh injury. And these fractures are really subtle, very difficult to see. And here we can just notice a small little radial lucency and that is the fracture. Sometimes these fractures are only visible on one projection, so you want to make sure you're looking at frontal, lateral, and oblique projections of the elbow. Don't underestimate how easy it is to miss these fractures. Sometimes the chisel fracture won't be visible on the x-ray, and the only thing you will be able to see is a joint effusion, or abnormal anterior and posterior fat pads of the elbow. So this is one of the first places you should look anytime you see an elbow x-ray and uh, do not miss a joint effusion of the elbow. A Smith's fracture is a fracture of the distal radius with associated anterior angulation of the distal fracture fragments. These may or may not be associated with an interarticular component to the fracture. 
These fractures typically occur from a fall with the wrist in a flexed position or a direct force to the posterior wrist. An orthosurgical consultation is often appropriate, especially if there's an articular involvement. Clavicle fractures are the most common fracture of the upper extremity. These fractures can occur at any part of the clavicle, however, the middle third is the most common. And there's a whole classification system called the NEAR classification, which is used for stability and treatment recommendations. The classic radiographic presentation is a fracture with the medial portion of the clavicle elevated and the lateral portion inferior. There are many possible complications with malunion or nonunion being the most common. Neurovascular injury, secondary degeneration, and osteolysis of the distal clavicle can also occur. A Galeazzi fracture dislocation is a fracture of the distal radius and a dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. So, radiographically, we're looking for a radial shaft fracture, usually at the junction of the middle and distal thirds. Then, widening and or dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. And sometimes you'll see radial shortening and dorsal angulation is very common. The most common mechanism of injury for a Galeazzi fracture dislocation is a foos injury, a fall on an outstretched hand. A nightstick fracture is an isolated fracture of the ulna, usually resulting from a direct blow. This is typically a defensive fracture where the arm is overhead in a protective position. An isolated fracture of the ulna from a fall is not that common, but can certainly happen. These are usually non-displaced fractures and not open, but they do have a higher probability for delayed or non-union. The most common carpal bone to fracture is the scaphoid bone. Up to 80% of all carpal fractures are of the scaphoid. So this is the normal presentation and location of the scaphoid bone. Radiographically, we're looking for a radiolucency, cortical offset, and possible displacement of the scaphoid. Most of these fractures are going to occur around the waist of the scaphoid, around 70 to 80 percent of them, and sometimes you're able to see some soft tissue swelling displacing the fat pads laterally. Scaphoid fracture is the most common radiographically occult fracture of the arm. Up to 5 to 20 percent of them can be missed on the initial radiographs. The scaphoid bone is the most common carpal bone to progress to avascular necrosis, meaning if there is a scaphoid fracture, it is a common complication to have avascular necrosis of the proximal pole of the scaphoid. What you're looking for on x-ray for avascular necrosis is sclerosis or opacity of that bone or proximal pole, and MRI is the gold standard for evaluating avascular necrosis. And here's a good example of a non-union scaphoid fracture uh, that's been here for a long time and demonstrates uh, secondary degenerative changes. A Collie's fracture is a non-articular fracture of the distal radius with associated posterior angulation of the distal fracture fragments. This type of fracture is particularly common in elderly women and is often due to a fall on an outstretched hand. There are several classification systems for the different varieties of Collie's fractures, many of which can lead to surgery. Other features of a Collie's fracture could include an associated ulnar styloid process fracture or the clinical presentation of a dinner fork deformity of the arm. A common fracture of the shoulder is a flap fracture. This is an avulsion fracture of the greater tuberosity of the humerus. The external rotated view of the shoulder typically demonstrates this fracture best. 
And if there's over one centimeter of displacement of the osseous fragment, there's often associated significant rotator cuff injury. So MRI of the shoulders often recommended. All right, well, thank you very much for listening. If you made it this far, please make sure you like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please put them below. Thanks again.